the grace. So we've just had a wonderful time of praying for people and imparting the spirit of sonship. So it's very fitting now to talk about the grace. Because even in, in receiving the placement as a son, there has been a bestowal, say a bestowal. That's something being placed on you. Like that, the prodigal son, when he came home and the father received him, he bestowed something on that son. He bestowed sonship. He bestowed a robe. He bestowed the ring. He bestowed sandals on his feet. Hallelujah. It was nothing, it had nothing to do with, you know, the son being good because he definitely wasn't good. (laughs) Amen. But he was turning back. It didn't have anything to do with him trying to attain that position because it's not attained, it's not earned, it's, it's, it's given by grace. And it's a bestowal of grace. Being a son is entering into a greater grace. Walking in a greater grace with the Father. And it's really learning how to walk in the grace from now on. Amen? That your life now is in the grace of God. You're walking, it's almost like I see the grace there. The grace is the smile of God on you. That's grace. It's him smiling on you. That's the grace. Amen. It's the light of his countenance being upon you. You know, Yahweh bless you and keep you. And may his face shine upon you and may he be gracious unto you and give you peace. May his face shine upon you. May he be gracious to you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So just receive the grace. Receive the grace. Receive God's favour. Receive him smiling on you. Hallelujah. Isn't he wonderful? Thank you, Jesus. So grace and peace to you from God, the Father of us and the Lord Jesus Christ. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And the love of God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Look at your neighbour and say, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Hallelujah. The Apostle Paul, he always, just I think it's always, ministered grace at the beginning of his letters. And just about every time ministered grace at the end of his letters. So he started with grace and he would finish with grace. There might have been a bit of roughing up and instruction and rebuking and correcting in the middle, but he started with grace and he finished with grace. Amen. It's to know that all of the, even all the correction and all the rebuking is done in grace. <laughs> Amen. So that's why Paul he would always, he'd generally finish his letters with, grace be with you. In other words, everything that I've written my instructions about, you're going to need grace to fulfill. So grace be with you. You can only do it by grace. Look at your neighbour and say, you can only do it by grace. Yep, you need grace. Say, I need grace. Yeah, we need grace. We need more grace. Hallelujah. And so, where does grace come from? Well, just picking out one of the letters, 1 Corinthians 1. 1 Corinthians 1. You could pretty much pick any one of Paul's letters. But 1 Corinthians 1 verse 3. 1 Corinthians, what what, what verse is it? You're going to your Bible before you go to your notes, aren't you? (laughs) <laughs> it's, it's in grace that I'm doing this because <laughs> it's going to help us Amen So 1 Corinthians 1 verse 3 what does it say? Grace to you and peace from from who? Ah, From God the Father of us more literally and Lord Jesus Christ So who is God? He's the Father of us Who is God? He's the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Not talking about two different people, but explaining who God is. 
God is the Father of us and God is the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And where does grace come from? It comes from God. It comes from God who is the Father of us and it comes from God who is the Lord Jesus Christ. So if we're going to receive grace, we need to come to God. Amen. We need to come to Him as our Father and we need to know that He is the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So it comes from God. Who does it come to? Well, in this, in this verse, or in this context, verse 2 of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, says, to the church of God. Say, the church of God. Church of God. So grace is extended from God to His church. So put up your hand if you're in the church of God. And I'm not talking about the denomination that's called the church of God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, this is talking about the church, the called out ones, the ecclesia. Amen. Those who know the calling out of the world to be a part of Jesus' body. Amen? Amen. To you, if you're in that church, you're a candidate to be receiving grace and grace and grace because every time you pick up the Bible and you read one of these letters, don't just go over, you know, don't just miss out the first three verses and say, okay, that's just a greeting. And let me now begin. No, they begin in verse 1. Verse 1 to 3 of 1 Corinthians is the infallible word of God inspired by the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. It's not just a greeting to be dismissed and let's just get to the meat now. No, you won't be able to receive the meat that's going to come unless you firstly receive the grace. See, <laughs> Paul, <laughs> Paul is giving grace so that then you'll be able to pallet, you'll be able to eat what he's about to give you. We need grace. He says, To the church of God which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified. Are you there with me? 1 Corinthians 1 verse 2. To those who are sanctified. Say sanctified. sanctified. By, so by being set apart to Jesus, you're, you're in the right position to be receiving grace. But if you're set apart for your own things, you're going to be outside of grace. See, we need to be sanctified in Christ Jesus. Say, in Christ Jesus. See, in Christ Jesus, you're in the position to receive grace. Why? Because in John chapter 1, verse 16, what, where is it? John chapter 1, verse 16 what does it say in John chapter 1 verse 16? It says that, and of his fullness, talking of Jesus the Christ, of his fullness we have all received grace for grace or grace upon grace. <coughs> Both of those is pretty good. If you say grace for grace, that's great because you receive grace so that you can receive more grace. Hallelujah. So out of his fullness comes grace for grace. So I receive some grace so I can get some more grace, so I can get some more grace, so I can get some more grace. It's just grace for grace for grace. Amen. Hallelujah. Who wants to live in that realm? Well, that is in Christ Jesus because of his fullness there is grace for grace for grace. Who wants to live an ever, a never-ending life of grace? where you just keep walking into more grace. Hallelujah. Well, it's, if you're sanctified in Christ Jesus, you are in the position to be receiving grace for grace. And it's grace upon grace. Multi-layers of grace. You know, you come into Christ Jesus, you put on a layer of grace. And then when you start walking in, oh, there's another layer. Oh, there's another layer. Oh, this grace is getting heavy, but it's lifting me up. Hallelujah. This grace is enabling me to walk in the fullness of Christ. Isn't that awesome? So this grace is received by those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus. Is that you? Hallelujah. Go back into 1 Corinthians 1 verse 2. I'll just finish off verse 2. It says, Called saints. Are you a saint? 
Are you a holy one? So it's very similar to this sanctified in Christ Jesus. Those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus are called saints. Amen. And so as saints together we can walk in the grace. As saints we have an inheritance, you know, because Daniel said that it's to the saints that the kingdom of, of God is given as an inheritance. And that's a gift of grace. And it's with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Put up your hand if you're a person who calls on the name. And you can recognise those around you who call on the name. All of us are partakers of grace together. Amen. We are partaking of the grace which is in Jesus the Messiah. So we want to we explore the grace. Who wants to explore the grace? We want to we understand more of how this, what this grace is, how it works in our life, how we can keep getting more. Amen. <clears throat> what this grace does to us. So let's go to the first mention of grace in the Bible. Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 8. Genesis chapter 6 verse 8. In the, in the context here in Genesis 6, things were looking very dim for mankind. God was not happy. He even said that he regretted making man because things had got so bad. But, say but. See, this is another one of those good buts in the Bible. Amen? But, so things are looking very bad, but in Genesis chapter 6 verse 8, what, what is it? Genesis chapter 6 verse 8, we read it together. But Noah found grace in the eyes of Yahweh. Wow. Noah found it. You know, grace can be found. Amen. Hallelujah. You can find grace. Noah found it. Even in the midst of his generation, he found grace. And that grace saved him and his family. Isn't that wonderful? Noah found that grace. And look at what that grace enabled him to do in verse 9. It says, this is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man. What's another word for just? He was righteous. Amen. So righteousness comes by finding grace. Hallelujah. You don't, won't have to go there, but I think it's in Romans 5, verse 17, one of Rob's favourite verses, Pastor Rob, that we have received of the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. You see, when we find grace, we find the gift of righteousness. Hallelujah. Who wants to walk in that bestowal, that gift of righteousness, which comes by grace? See, Noah found grace, and that grace enabled him to walk in righteousness. Hallelujah. Who wants to walk in that righteousness? It comes by finding grace. Noah was a just man. Then what does it say? Perfect in his generations. That word perfect could be blameless or having integrity in his generation. This is the power of grace. If you find grace, you will be able to receive of the gift of righteousness and walk in blamelessness and integrity in your generation. See, God wants a generation of people who will walk in righteousness and integrity in their generation. How's it going to happen? We need to find grace. Look at your neighbour and say, you need to find grace. And then the, the, the third thing out of verse 9 was, is, Noah walked with who? He walked with God. I think... It only really clearly says that about one other person. Who knows? Enoch. Enoch. Enoch walked with God and Noah walked with God. Hallelujah. What happened to Enoch? He just was not. <laughs> Hallelujah. He was not because God received him. Hallelujah. And Noah walked with God because he found grace. 
You can only walk with God if you find the grace. Hallelujah. So I want you to realise grace can be found. There was something about Noah that attracted the grace of God. Hallelujah. And so I'll just give you this word in the Hebrew, this word for grace. It's the Hebrew number 2580 in the Strong's Concordance. And it means, it means graciousness. That's, that's the first meaning it gives. That is kindness. Say kindness. kindness. Favour. And it even says objectively it also means beauty. <clears throat> you know, there was something... See, when the grace of God comes on your life, now, especially it's easy for women to, under, to get this, but it makes you beautiful. When the grace of God comes on your life, there's, it, there's something attractive about you now. And I'm not talking physically. Although physically you can see it on somebody, can't you? You can see when someone's walking in the grace. There's a beauty about them. There's something that is attractive about them that you, you're saying, no, it's not their facial features. It's something else. There's something on them. There's grace on them. Hallelujah. See, there's something about Jesus. He was of no form or comeliness that we should desire him. It wasn't that he was a, a great looking man. But at the same time he was because there was something different about him, something that separated him from other people. He walked in grace. In fact, of his fullness came grace for grace. Hallelujah. In fact, in John chapter 1, verse 14, in John chapter 1, verse 14, what is it? So you should flip there because it's an important verse. John chapter 1, verse 14 Oh, you should know it off by heart, yes. It says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. Say, full of grace. See, Jesus, the Word, God, in the flesh, the glory that he revealed was full of grace. Who wants to walk in the glory? <clears throat> Who wants to manifest the glory? What are sons, what is the awesome you know, privilege that as sons we have? It's to manifest the glory. God wants sons manifesting the glory. And what is that glory full of? Grace and truth. Grace. Grace. Noah found grace. It can be found. Now just on the meaning of this word grace in the Old Testament, it comes from, I'll give you the number, it comes from 2603. So the root word that this word grace comes from is number 2603. And it means to bend, like to bend down or to stoop. In, in kindness, so it's to bend down or stoop in kindness to somebody inferior to you. That's interesting, isn't it? In other words, it's somebody who has authority that they could probably do damage to you and use the authority in a bad way if they wanted to towards you, but their choice is to bend down and stoop down in kindness and to help you. Hallelujah. So, grace, when somebody does something wrong, someone who lacks grace will just yell at them and call them, you know, you, you're stupid, you didn't do this, 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 this. But someone who knows how to do the job that person's trying to do, so in that sense that person is inferior, because I know more than them in that situation. You don't go up all puffed up and say, I know how to do this. And you don't, you're so silly. No, to show grace is, brother, sister, let me help you. Let me show you how this is done. 
Hallelujah. That's the sort of person Jesus was. Jesus could have come and condemned the world. You are all filthy, rotten people. You guys don't know how to walk with God. (laughs) But what did Jesus decide to do? Let me come. Let me humble myself and become a man. And let me get on your level and let me help you. Let me show you how to walk with God. That's grace. Hallelujah. Isn't that wonderful? Noah found it. Noah found God to be that sort of person. Hallelujah. And God helped him. He became righteous, he became blameless, and he walked with God because he found that kindness and that favour from God. Hallelujah. Isn't that wonderful? That's grace. And, and it also means to bestow, like I've been saying. It's a bestowal. It's just giving you something because that person who is a superior, because he just wants to give it to you. <laughs> it's not even based on anything you're doing. It's just he wants to give it to you. That's grace. You know, God just wants to give himself to you. He wants to bestow all of his glory on you just as a gift of grace. You don't have to attain some sort of, you know, work to get into that place. It's, it's a gift. It's grace. He wants to put his glory on you. And you see, God in his grace is wanting to give you more of himself than even you're willing to receive. Hallelujah. Grace. Let's just look at a couple of other places in the Old Testament. Let's look in Exodus Chapter 33. Because you know there's grace in the Old Testament. Most people tend to think it's not. They think just New Testament grace, Old Testament's not there. No, well Noah found it. Noah found grace. Moses also found grace. Exodus 33, verse 12. The one through whom the law came found grace. Hallelujah. Verse 12, Exodus 33, verse 12. Let's read it together. Then Moses said to Yahweh, See, you say to me, Bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found grace in my sight. Moses found grace. Hallelujah. You're going to find out in this passage between verse 12 and verse 17, Grace is mentioned five times. That's a lot of grace. (laughs) Hallelujah. Verse 13. Moses, still talking to God, says, Now therefore I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way, that I may know you, and that I may find grace in your sight, and consider that this nation is your people. So, Moses is saying now, on the basis that I've found grace in your sight, now please show me your way. I want to know you. Hallelujah. So in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, it says in 2 Peter 3, 18, that we are to grow in the grace of and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Because you know what grace does? Grace, when we find grace in the sight of God, we then come into knowing who he is. Hallelujah. And so Moses, in finding grace, now that I've got grace, I want to know you for who you are. I want to know your way. I want to grow in that grace. Amen? So brethren, put in your notes that we are to grow in the grace and the knowledge then of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. God wants you to grow in grace and because of growing in grace, you're going to grow in the knowledge, the experiential reality of who God is. See, grace leads you into the experience because grace is real. Amen? Grace is tangible. Who's experienced the grace? That it's, it's not just... It's not 
It's tangible. You can touch it. It's, you can feel it. It does something to your heart. Who's experienced that? That strange warmth that softens you and enables you to receive more of God. Who knows when you're stony, that's when you're proud and God resists the proud. But what does he do to the humble? He gives grace to the humble. And so when, when you're willing to allow that stony heart to drop down a bit, to break up a little bit, you know, grace starts coming in and the warmth starts coming in and it, and it, and it smooths out and, and that stoniness suddenly becomes, it melts. Hallelujah. Who's experienced that? The grace. So back in Exodus 33, in verse 14, Exodus 33, verse 14, And God said, let's read it together, My presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Hallelujah. So when we begin to experience the grace, God begins to release his presence. Hallelujah. By grace we experience the presence of God. It's a bestowal of his grace. And he says in verse 15, Then Moses said to him, If your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. Oh, and I didn't mention that. So from grace we experience the presence. And where does the presence lead us to? What does the presence give us? According to this verse, rest. Say rest. rest. You see, when you begin to experience the grace, you can cease from your own labours. You can rest. Hallelujah. You see, God always wants his people to walk in the grace so that they can experience his presence and that presence will give you rest. In fact, the name of Noah really meant rest. He found grace and God was able to rest in his life because he couldn't rest with everybody else. Hallelujah. In verse 16, For how then will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight except you go with us? See, the presence of God among us actually testifies to God's grace being with us. Hallelujah. So when the world sees a people in whom the presence of God is manifest, that's a testimony to God's grace. People see the kindness of God. People see the grace of God. Remember that verse we've seen a few times over this school? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7. You should probably get to start to know that off by heart now. That in the ages to come, he might demonstrate the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. What does God want to do? He wants to keep demonstrating the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So when people in the world see the presence of God on us, it's to demonstrate and testify to God's grace. Hallelujah. The riches of his grace. Verse 17. Oh, verse, sorry, the end of verse 16. So we shall be separate. Say separate. Say the grace of God separates me from the rest of the world. The grace of God separates you. Hallelujah. See, the grace of God is not the license for you to do whatever you want. Some people teach that. Some people share grace in such a way as that. But Moses and then Paul in the New Testament as well realise that grace actually separates you from the rest of the world. Hallelujah. Because grace changes you. And grace brings the presence of God on your life. And God's presence does not hang around people who want to do their own thing. But people who are humble and receive grace, God's presence loves to hang around them. And that grace separates us. Who wants to be a separate people because of the grace? 
Not because just not just because you dress differently. Not just because, you know, whatever it might be outwardly, but you're separated because of the grace. People notice the grace. Verse 17. So Yahweh said to Moses, I will also do this thing that you have spoken, for you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. Verse 18 then, and Moses said, this is Moses' response, to God reminding him again that he had found grace in his sight. What did Moses respond? Please show me your Glory. glory. See, the grace brings us into the glory. Yes. Hallelujah. What was the glory for love in Jesus? Full of grace. So I want you to see that grace is so linked to the glory. If we are to experience the glory, it's not going to be just from a manifestation of God's power. It's actually going to be a manifestation of God's grace. Hallelujah. If you like, just to see how grace, in that sense, supersedes power, God releases his power by his grace. <laughs> Amen? The power of God is actually an act of the grace. Hallelujah. It's God deciding to do something out of his grace to help us, and so he releases his power. Hallelujah. So you see, grace actually covers over the power. Amen? So when God decides to release his power to heal somebody, see in the past, people have taken glory for that. Oh, the power! Not realising that was just an act of God's grace right there. It was a demonstration of his power, but it came because of God's grace. Grace was what was motivating God to do that. Hallelujah. And so we will do much better that when we see the power of God move, that we recognise that it's the grace of God that is releasing that power to move in somebody's life. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. Please show me your glory. Show me your glory. And then verse 19, final verse in this passage we'll look at. Then God said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, And I will proclaim the name of Yahweh before you. I will be... Say it together. I will be... To whom I will be gracious. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. God is fully in charge of his grace. Amen. God shows grace to whomever he wants to show it. So just be open. (laughs) Be open right now because God may just decide that he wants to show you his grace. Because he said, I'll be gracious to whom I will be gracious. You can't twist my arm, but if you do humble yourself, I've already told you that I'll give you grace. Amen? Hallelujah. So we can draw the grace by humbling ourselves. Amen? Awesome. So let's go to Psalm 45. Another aspect of the grace in the Old Testament. Psalm 45, verse 2. This is a poetic psalm. It is a messianic psalm. Say a messianic psalm. That means it's a psalm that is revealing something of the Messiah. Amen? It's a psalm about the king. In fact, the New King James Version... Puts, it's, this is not in the Bible as such, but it's in the New King James Version Bible. It puts the title of this psalm, The Glories of the Messiah and His Bride. Hallelujah. So in Psalm 45 verse 2, talking about the king, so this is the king. Who's the king? Who's our king? Who's the ruler over the kings of the earth? Who's the king of kings? It's Jesus. But what sort of king is he? It says in verse 2, You are fairer than the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips. Hallelujah. That's wonderful, isn't it? 
So where in this verse, what does it teach us about grace? Where does grace come from? Your lips. It comes from the lips of the king. It comes from the mouth. So Jesus imparts grace through his word. Hallelujah. Grace comes through the word. See, when you minister the word, it releases grace. Well, it should do. <laughs> Hallelujah. You can minister the word like a shotgun and just shoot the truth. <laughs> <laughs> or you can bring the truth with grace. And what is bringing the truth with grace? It's explaining the truth while saying God is here to help you. Hallelujah. It's not giving someone the truth and not showing them how they can act on it. That's not going to help anybody. But if we speak the truth with grace, we speak the truth and then give people the ingredients for how they can attain to the truth. Hallelujah. Are you understanding? Why did Jesus get so angry at the Pharisees? Because he said, you guys have the keys of knowledge, you guys have the scriptures, but you don't pick up one finger to try and help anybody to do it. In other words, you've got no grace. You're legalists, you're truth people without any grace. And so you're actually blinded from the glory of God. You don't see the glory. Because God's glory has got to do with him being gracious. Let me help you. <laughs> Hallelujah. So grace comes from the mouth. Let me show you a confirming verse in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 29. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 29. See, all of you here can be a conduit of grace. Look at your neighbour and say, I want some grace from you today. <laughs> <laughs> and let's see how yeah <laughs> let's see how we can impart grace to each other Ephesians 4:29 let's are you there Ephesians chapter 4 verse 29 <clears throat> read it together let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. There's, say, impartation. impartation. See, who wants to be someone who imparts grace? You know, impartation is spirit to spirit. See, when you impart something, it comes out of you and goes into the person that you're with. Isn't that powerful? It imparts. So when we speak edification, things that are good and necessary to build up our brothers and sisters, it imparts grace. Hallelujah. You know, I was just thinking what, what Apostle Paul Galligan shared in the last session. He shared at one time he was serving you know, taking up the offering and then the word came from the pastor, you're going to be an elder. This young man will be an elder in the future. You know what that was? That imparted something. That was an impartation of grace. Hallelujah. Who wants to be people like that? That when you speak, you impart grace and by imparting grace, you release people into their destiny. You release people to walk in what God had always planned for them. Oh, how powerful. How powerful is our mouth. So let no corrupt word proceed from your mouth, but think about what you can speak that's going to impart grace. You know, maybe my husband is not what I want him to be. Well, why don't you, why don't you speak grace? Speak something that will impart grace. Maybe my wife isn't what I want her to be. You know, not, not that you want her to be what you want her to be, but, you know, she's driving me up the wall or something. What am I going to do? Oh, God, help me. Let no corrupt word proceed from my mouth, but let me speak what is good that's going to edify and impart grace. 
Maybe that could change the situation. Hallelujah. Maybe that will bring an impartation. Oh, hallelujah. And maybe that will bring the enablement for that person that you're speaking to to walk in their destiny in Christ. Hallelujah. That's powerful, isn't it? All right, let's go to Jeremiah. Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 2. Jeremiah 31 verse 2. This is another grace in the Old Testament. Jeremiah 31 2. You're all going there? Did that before you went to your notes? Good. Okay. Jeremiah 31 verse 2. Thus says Yahweh, the people who survived the sword found grace in the Israel when I went to give him rest. Ah, so here's another, here's some words that we've seen before. The people who survived the sword. Now, who of you here has survived the sword? Who of you here has been a little bit beaten up in life, but you've survived? You're here. Amen. You're not dead. You're alive. You've made it to here. Hallelujah. <coughs> You've, become, you've come thus far and grace will lead you home. <laughs> Hallelujah. So, you've survived. You might have been beaten up. People might have said lots of horrible things about you. You could have been abused and, and, and horribly mistreated in lots of situations in your life. But say, praise God, I've survived. I'm not dead. There's life in me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You see, there's life there, so there's hope. Because those who survived the sword, what did they find? Grace! Grace! So you're in the place today. If you've survived, you're in the place today to find grace. Hallelujah. You can find it today. Jesus. Hallelujah. We, they found, and where did they find the grace? Yeah, it wasn't in the palace. <laughs> the grace wasn't even found in the inheritance yet. <laughs> the grace was found in that desert dry place where there was no water and where you were just surviving. That's where you find grace. Hallelujah. So brethren... Know that God's grace can touch you no matter where you are. No matter what you're in, you can find grace. Hallelujah. You know, in my mind, I think of people who should be here speaking, listening to this. (laughs) But there is some people that I know who are here who should be here and they're hearing it. (laughs) Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Grace is found in the wilderness. It's not found when everything's good. I mean, you can still find it when everything's good, but that's not, it's not, you don't find it just when you're in the palace and life is going well and then stuff is easy. But it's in the wilderness that we find the grace and that grace then, what does it lead us to? It leads us to the rest. Israel, when I went to give him rest, See, God extends the hand of grace and he says, let me help you. I see that you've just survived and you, you maybe haven't been calling out on me just yet. But I see you're in a very dry and a very thirsty place. And there's no one around, so now I can talk to you and you're going to hear me. I'm here to help you. I'm here to draw you out of here and give you a place of rest. Do you want to follow me? Here, I'll impart some grace to you so that now you can get up and begin to walk with me. Hallelujah. And when you begin to walk with me, know that from my fullness there's grace for more grace. So keep walking in the grace with me. 
Hallelujah. And I will give you rest. Let's go to Zechariah, isn't he? I know that's speaking, amen? Jesus, and this is to help us realise what he wants to do with our lives, but then this is to change, to, to transform the way that we minister the gospel ourselves. Amen? Because we are to minister the gospel of the grace of God. That's Acts 20, 24. That we, that the gospel of the grace of God. That's what we minister. Isn't that good, Rob? <laughs> Zechariah chapter 4, verse 7. Zechariah. Zechariah talked about grace. In fact, a couple of times. Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 7. Are you there? Let's read it. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel you shall become a plain, and he shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. So this is in the context of the rebuilding of the house of God. Children of Israel have been in exile in Babylon. They've now come back to the land and it's time to rebuild the house of God that was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. And God says, he encourages Zerubbabel who is a type of the apostle, a type of the builder of the house of God because he's been given the responsibility to build the house of God. And he says to Zerubbabel, Every mountain of opposition before you, I will make it a plain. And you shall bring forth the capstone. What is the capstone? It's, no, it's the final stone to be put in place in the building. It's the capstone. It's the, it's the stone that is the final stone. It's, when you put that stone in, the building is complete. Hallelujah. So he's saying to Zerubbabel, he's encouraging him that you will bring forth that final stone and when you do, there's going to be a shout. And the shout will be grace, grace to it. See, the house of God is to be a testimony of the grace. That when, when the house of God has come to completion, it's going to be revealing the grace. We've been learning about sons. See, the house of God is the dwelling place of God and it's really the place where sons are. Amen. It's the Father's house. And in the Father's house he has sons. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5 and 6. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5 and 6. You should know this off by heart now. Having predestined us to the adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, according to the praise, to the praise of the glory of his... To the praise of the glory of his grace. Shouts of grace. Grace to it. It's to the praise of the glory of his grace. Look at those sons. Look at the house of God. Wow, look at this complete, perfect, glorious bride. It's to the praise of the glory of his grace. You see, it's the grace. The house of God is built by grace. We become sons of God by grace. It's to the praise of the glory of his grace. By which, in verse 6, he has graced us with every grace in the beloved. <laughs> so let's do that again. You see, Zechariah chapter 4 verse 7 is in the context of the rebuilding of the house of God. It's a prophetic picture of the end time church. It happened in the first context. It was literal that they built a house in Jerusalem. But it's prophetic for us of the glorious house, the latter day house, the, da the house that God is building today that we've heard something about by, from Pastor Rob that's built on the foundation of apostles and prophets, etc. It's this dwelling place for God in the spirit. It's the church of the living God, the house of God which is the church of the living God. And so 
God says to Zerubbabel to encourage him. Zerubbabel is a type of an apostle. Why is he a type of the apostle? Because he's the one who's been given the responsibility to build the house. Apostles build the house. They have the responsibility as wise master builders to build the house. That's a gift of grace. The apostolic ministry is a gift of grace. He says, according to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder. Hallelujah. And so he encourages Zerubbabel as a type of apostle, the builder of the house. You know what, Zerubbabel? You will bring forth the capstone. And he even says before that, that every mountain of opposition, Zerubbabel, it will become a plain before you. Why? Because the church that Jesus is building, which includes him giving apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers. So the church that Jesus is building, the gates of hell will not prevail against that church. So he says to Zerubbabel, the mountains before you will become a plain. No amount of opposition will be able to stop you. And it will be completed. You will see it. You will bring forth the capstone that final stone being put in place. And as soon as that stone gets put in place, there comes a shout. Grace! Grace to it. Hallelujah. The house of God is a house of sons. Say sons. We are the Father's house. The Father has sons. And as that house, as sons, according to Ephesians 1 verse 5 and 6, we have been predestined to the placement as sons, mature sons, by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace. Sons are to the praise of the glory of his grace. And then in verse 6 of Ephesians 1, it said, by which he has graced us with every grace in the beloved. Three mentions of grace in those two verses like that. Your Bible says, by which he has made you accepted in the beloved. It's more literally by which he has graced you with every grace in the beloved. Isn't that powerful? And I think that's in your Bible. You can see it. There's a little, there's a little number one next to the word accepted in Ephesians 1 verse 6. You can see it for yourself. In Ephesians 1 verse 6, there's a little number one by the word accepted. You look in the margin under verse 6 and it says, number one, L-I-T, literally, Graced with grace. Graced with grace. Look at your neighbour and say, You are graced with grace. You are graced with grace. You are to the praise of the glory of His grace. Thank you, Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? Are you, are you experiencing the grace? The grace is almost overpowering in its gentleness. <laughs> See, the grace doesn't come like power. But the grace just starts to come and it, it overwhelms you and very often you start to weep because of the grace, because of the kindness that is being shown towards you even though you know how filthy and rotten you are inside. And yet God still is just giving you kindness and grace and he's just pouring it on you and you're thinking inside of your heart, I don't deserve this. And that's true, you don't. But God doesn't care. He just wants to keep giving it to you anyway. <laughs> See, when the, when the prodigal son came home, he was thinking, all right, I'm coming home, but dad, I'll just be a servant. But you know, the father didn't listen. It was not based on what he deserved. Amen? It was just a father giving him the grace to be a son. 
You're my son. So I'm just pouring my grace on you. I'm bestowing my grace on you. Zechariah 12 verse 10. Zechariah 12 verse 10. A wonderful prophetic verse. Zechariah 12 verse 10. We read it. Are you there? What is it? Zechariah 12 verse 10. And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of? Ha, ah, there's a spirit of grace. A big S. <laughs> it's a big spirit. <laughs> It's the Holy Spirit. It's God's Spirit. Hallelujah. And one of the names, see this is even, you could say this is one of the names of God. This is one of the names you need to know. Knowing God by His name. He's the Spirit of grace. Say, oh, say God, I hallow your name. You are the Spirit of grace. <laughs> see, God is the Spirit of grace. God is Spirit. And He is the Spirit of grace. So when you come to know God, you get to know grace. We grow in the grace and knowledge. So the spirit of grace and supplication. What's going to happen because of the spirit of grace and supplication being poured out? Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, and they will mourn. Remember I was saying when that grace starts coming on you, very often what does it cause? Tears, mourning. Because you do experience how wretched you are inside, but God just keeps pouring out his grace on you. And you just say, oh, I don't deserve this. And like I said before, God says, I don't care. It's got nothing to do with whether or not you deserve it. I'm just giving it to you. (laughs) Just receive, receive, receive. Because the more you receive, the more in love with me you're going to (laughs) get. Hallelujah. Because grace always causes a response. You know, I probably won't get time to fully show it, but that word grace in the New Testament, that word grace actually comes from a root word which means joy. So the root word of grace is joy or rejoicing. See, what does grace always cause when you receive it? Finally, you rejoice. Amen? Joy is released. Hallelujah. You can't help but be happy. So you know when somebody's walking into a room and they're happy, are they, there's some sort of grace on them. <clears throat> Hallelujah. You know if someone's sad, you need to go and impart some grace <laughs> so that they can be released in some joy. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. By the way, this word grace and the word supplication here, it actually has a bit of a a double meaning in that the the word supplication comes from the same root word for grace. So he says, I'm going to pour out on you the spirit of grace to receive more grace. (laughs) So it's very similar to John 1.16. Amen, that of his fullness we receive grace for grace. So God says, I'll pour out the spirit of grace so you can just keep asking for more grace. Because that's what the supplication is, that you're petitioning God for more grace. So when God releases the spirit of grace in you, it releases you to say, God, give me more grace. (laughs) Hallelujah. Yes, and you can release it then to others. So it overflows, so that they can look on him who was pierced and that they can mourn and say, Jesus, I need you in my life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah so that they can see that he was pierced for their transgressions. He was bruised for their iniquities. That was all an act of God's grace and kindness towards us. Hallelujah. <laughs> so that's the, uh, old, that's the introduction. <laughs> yeah. So let me just show you just a couple of places in the new and then we'll finish. But isn't that wonderful? Oh, are you experiencing the grace? How did, did you realise there was so much grace in the Old Testament? 
Most people go, ah, it's all law, law, law. No, there's lots of grace. Hallelujah. There's lots of grace. Because God has never changed. God's the same. He's always been full of grace. He's great, merciful and gracious. Hallelujah. So, brethren, I'm just going to choose Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. And verse 11. Beginning in verse 11. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. Titus 2, 11. What is it? Hallelujah. So let's read. Are you there? Let's read it. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Hey, the grace of God appeared. You could see it. See, the grace of God is visible. You can see the grace. It appeared. The grace of God that brings salvation appeared. Who was that? See, it appeared in a man. That grace that brings salvation appeared in the flesh. Jesus is grace in the flesh. Hallelujah. He is the embodiment of grace. So the grace of God that brings salvation appeared. And what does the grace do in verse 12? It teaches. Look at your neighbour and say, Grace is your teacher. And you see, even all the ministry gifts are given by grace. And what do they do? They teach. And they impart grace. Amen? You see, by imparting that grace through the Word, the ministry of the Word, it teaches people. The grace of God teaches. Hallelujah. And what does it teach us? It teaches us to deny ungodliness. So this is, again, another verse just to help you that in no way... Is there anything in the Bible that teaches that the grace of God gives a license to sin or do whatever you want? The grace actually teaches you to deny ungodliness. What else does the grace teach you? It teaches you to deny worldly lusts. Who's ever succumbed to a worldly lust and experienced the loss of grace? But you just know you stepped out of the grace. Mm. So let's learn how to live in the grace. It teaches us, what else does it teach us? To live soberly. Say soberly. soberly. That means to live, live out of a saved mind. In other words, to live in the salvation that Jesus has won for you. What else does it teach us? It teaches us to live righteously. What else does it teach us? It teaches us to live godly. When? In heaven when you die. No, in the present age or the present world. Hallelujah. And what else does it teach us to do? It teaches us to look for the blessed hope and appearance of the glory of the great God and Saviour of us, Jesus, the Messiah. So the grace teaches us to look for that blessed hope. Grace releases the hope so that we can look for the appearance of of God's glory, the appearance of the glory of the great God and Saviour of us, Jesus, the anointed King, the Messiah. Hallelujah. So brethren, this is, this is the verse to leave you on and this is what I'm commending you to. Acts chapter 20, verse 32. Acts chapter 20, Verse 32, I'm going to commend you to the grace. That means I'm going to put you into the hands of God's grace. I'm going to commend you to the grace. So in Acts 20, 32, are you ready to be commended to the grace? So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are being sanctified. So brethren, I commend you to God 
and to the word, to the message of his grace, knowing that that is able to build you up and it's able, that grace, that message of his grace is able to give you an inheritance among all of you. You can look around and see all of you who are being sanctified. So receive the grace. I commend you to the grace of God. Amen.